How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio, February 27, 2024. Figure 4 online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. We've got a lot of news to talk about here today, including the death of Ole Anderson, who 21 years ago, Dave, had quite a back and forth with you on Wrestling Observer Live. I hope that's not what he's best remembered for. It's not what he's best remembered for, but it was the first thing a lot of people on this website were talking about because oh, that God. was a legendary was a episode of Wrestling oh. Observer Live I where know, I guy. went like this. Yeah, the um, yeah he, you know, he came on to sell books and he didn't sell any books. That's that, that you know that was the basic gist of it. Um, I had read that book from cover to cover, and he was trying to stump me and. He didn't do it, that's for sure. Um, Ole was a really interesting character. I mean, he was—I mean, he was one of the greatest promos that there ever was, one of the most underrated promos that there ever was. And he had uh, a great, great feud with Dusty Rhodes in Georgia Championship Wrestling for a couple of years. But the original incarnation, which I guess we were around seventy-nine-ish, when we first got Georgia Wrestling on cable, you know, it was Ole Anderson and Ivan Koloff were the the heel tag team. And Dusty Rhodes every week would have a new partner, Bill Watts, Wrestling 2, Mad Dog Vashon, Tommy Rich, you know, um, you know, Thunderbolt Patterson, I think. I mean, there was, um, well, actually, Dusty rarely teamed with Thunderbolt. I should take that back. Thunderbolt usually wrestled the weeks Dusty wasn't there. But um, it was a hell of a feud, and they did very, very well. And um, Oli was the booker. And, I mean, wrestling was hot there. He did a great job. He was a great booker, and then he wasn't a great booker years later. You know, it's one of those things where it's the right guy who understood the pulse of the fan base, and then the fans changed, and he was one of those guys where it's it's always it's the same. It's the same. You just got to do it, and it's like, you know, by the 80s, you know, it wasn't the same, and by the 90s, it was long gone. But um, but in his time, I mean, you know, seventy six to whatever eighty one ish, whatever those those that, that run, it was a great booker and um, booked the Carolinas for years. Um, at one point, he was booking Georgia and the Carolinas, which even he admitted was just way too much. You know, trying to book four shows a night in two territories with God knows how many wrestlers are working those two territories. Um, he tried, but you know it was it was just too difficult of a job. I don't know that anyone could have done it. Although Tony Khan tries to do stuff like that, booking ROH and all all the time, <laughs> he's got more talent <laughs> than those guys had by far, and uh, trying to sort out all this AEW and you know all the TV, which is competitive rather than you know in that era booking television wasn't that difficult. It's like okay, what job guy are we going to have lose to the star, and then they're going to cut a promo, and you know. I mean, it was, um, you know, some angles here and there. Um, it's very, very different. You know, you didn't have to do nearly as much as now. And, um, you know, and you were a monopoly in your territory, so it was you were the only wrestling people saw. But um, Oli was uh, – Oli first came um, into wrestling in the, the mid to late 60s. You know, I would say around 66-ish. And he'd gotten out of college, and he used this – big guy with a big chest and big arms you know just like a big power lifting looking guy and he wanted to be a wrestler he wanted to be a pro wrestler and hit up the awa i mean he was from minnesota hit up the awa Vern Gagne. so they brought him to a, a tryout basically and they liked him because Vern thought he was kind of built like the crusher and the crusher was like the biggest star that you know the biggest drawing card that they had so they thought he could kind of be like a, you know, in the bruiser, you know, like those guys. That, that that stuff was really over in that era, and so they liked the look. He was a younger version of them, and um, they brought him to the gym. And it's a very famous gym story. They brought him to the gym with Vern Gagne, Dale Lewis, and Danny Hodge, and they go, you know, you want to be a wrestler? Um, which one of us do you want to take on first? And he goes, I want the little one. Now. Ole claims he knew who Danny Hodge was. However, why he would ask for Danny Hodge first or ask to wrestle Danny Hodge, I have no idea if he really knew who Danny Hodge was. But he said, oh, I knew who Danny Hodge was. They, Their claim was that he had no idea who any of them were. 
And Danny Hodge did what Danny Hodge does. And then Dale Lewis, who was a two-time Olympian, uh, did what Dale Lewis does. And now this guy's just completely gassed. And then Vern, you know, who was a uh, Olympic caliber wrestler, you know, I mean, he didn't, he never wrestled in the Olympics themselves because, um, I think it was Henry Wittenberg was ahead of him, who was one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, but he was still a two time NCAA champion and a hell of a, you know, I mean, um, Henry Wittenberg said in the 48 Olympics that Vern was tougher than all the guys he beat to win the gold medal. So, um, you know, he was, Vern was the alternate. Um, so, I mean, Vern was an awesome wrestler. So, anyway, that was his introduction. The first I remember him was as Alan the Rock Rogowski. His real name is Alan Rogowski. And um, wrestled in uh, the Omaha Territory. Big star there. You know, I mean, they were small territory, but he was, uh, you know, he was one of the top guys there. And then, um, at this point in the Carolinas, Gene Anderson had gone to the Carolinas. There's of no relation, um, although... You know, obviously they were a brother team. Gene and Lars, who was also of no relation, although Ole and Lars, I believe, knew each other um, from college because um, Ole had done some college wrestling and Lars was a very good, you know, Division three wrestler. I mean, not, you know, I mean, it's Division three, but I mean, he placed in nationals. He was a good wrestler. And... Um, Gene and Lars Anderson were the original Minnesota Wrecking Crew in the Carolinas, and they were together for a while. And then uh, Lars went to the AWA back, you know, back to his you know home area. And uh, Lars was tag teaming with Larry the Axe Hennig. They were a uh, kind of like a uh, uh, the number three heel team because number one was Stevens and Bockwinkel, number two was Rhodes and Murdoch, and number three was um, Hennig and. Um, Lars Anderson, uh, Lush, Lars Anderson, pretty boy, Larry Hennig. So they needed another Anderson. So um, they brought in Alan Rogowski as Ole Anderson, and he continued. And, and Gene, and, and even though Gene and Lars were the ones who, you know, kind of built the reputation of the Andersons as tough guys, you know, it was Gene and Ole who were by far the most famous team because they had the longevity. So they teamed up for years and years, and they were – the Carolinas was a tag team territory in the early 70s. You know, you had um, Rip Hawk and Sweet Hanson, Gene and Ole, and there were, there were other, many other teams that were there and many babyface teams. Um, Johnny Weaver and George Becker were, were one of the big ones until they finally could get rid of George Becker and, um, you know, George and Sandy Scott and, you know, just, just that thing. So, and then when, the territory got much bigger and brought in like, you know, Johnny Valentine, Wahoo McDaniel and all that. Then, you know, the Andersons were, were, were the top tag team on a generally the top heel tag team on a pretty big stage. And they also worked in Georgia, you know, feuded a lot with wrestling one and wrestling two in that era. And they were also instrumental with Ric Flair. When Ric Flair first came to the territory from the AWA, Wahoo McDaniel got him in and, um, and, he was billed as the cousin of the Andersons from Minneapolis. So when Flair came in, even though he didn't team so much with them, the the Andersons being heels from Minnesota, um, it they had like the pretty boy cousin. So it kind of, I mean, it definitely helped Rick at first. I mean, Rick would have made it either way if he was nobody's cousin. You know, it didn't really... You know, I mean, it, 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 but it absolutely helped him at first. I mean, um, as far as like getting credibility and everything like that. And, uh, you know, they, um, they had some big runs. I mean, one of the big runs was Gene and Ole against Ric Flair and Greg Valentine when, you know, uh, both were heel teams. That drew very, very well. And Rick and Ole, you know, had some, you know, it was funny. Ole, you know, Ole was, uh, an interesting, um, booker. I mean, he he absolutely had his success and he absolutely had his failures, and I mean, people will, would always talk about somehow like he couldn't see talent in certain people because I remember guys would always go like Ole Anderson was the only Booker who couldn't see anything in Ricky Steamboat, you know, or Randy Savage is another one. Um, in his book, he, um, you know, I mean, he bragged about firing Hulk Hogan and. I remember on that show that you're talking about, you know, he was going off on how Hulk Hogan, um, 
you know, every gym in every gym in America's got a guy who looks like Hulk Hogan. He's nothing special. And it's like, and they would always talk about it like, you know, he can't draw. And it's like, dude, the guy is drawing. But all he was like, you know, he was out of the business and he had, he just thought he sold dolls and he didn't draw any money, which of course was ludicrous. Hogan was one of the biggest draws of all time. And he was just like, any, you know, anyone could be Randy Savage. He thought that Flair had talent, but, you know, he, um, you know, he was a routine player, which he was. Rick did a similar routine, and Ole wrestled a certain way. But I always remember Lanny Poffo used to always say it best where, because Ole would go in the dressing room and talk about the Andersons make you believe. You know, Ric Flair's an entertainer, but the Andersons, they make you believe. And Lanny would go like, I would work, you know, he was a prelim guy. He goes, I'd work on the shows with Ole and Lars and, I mean, Ole and Gene, and, you know, the houses were, were a quarter or half full. And then I'd go on the ones with Rick, and they were sold out. So, you know, and, and, he, and then he'd listen to Ole tell those speeches. So, um, you know, that was uh, Ole, you know, but again, Ole was a fantastic talker, and the Andersons were a successful team. Um, but, I mean, Ole, like, would, tell, would say, like, the reason Ric Flair became world champion was because I, I wanted him out of the territory. He was killing the territory, which is ridiculous because he was the biggest draw in the territory. And... Um, nobody makes a guy world champion because he's killing the local territory. I mean, that's just ludicrous, but he actually would claim that. And then when Rick would come back to the territory's champion, and Ole was a single when Gene wasn't wrestling, you know, who do you want to boat work with? Ric Flair. You know, and they did, they did, they, they headlined a big Thanksgiving show, one of the Thanksgiving shows at Greensboro that sold out. Um, so they did, you know, they had a very good, you know, Rick, Rick and Ole against each other did a good feud. And um, then later in his career, you had the Four Horsemen. He was one of the original members. Um, when they brought in Luger, they basically kicked out Ole um, as a Four Horseman, made him a baby face. And I think Ole going against, you know, the other guys, there was something to that. That was pretty good. Um, you know, and the original Four Horsemen, you know, was which was a takeoff on the, the you know, that, that whole Four Horsemen thing was kind of like one of those things that, just happened it was there was nobody's plan they just had um Ole and Arn were a tag team and Ric Flair and Tully Blanchard were single stars with with belts and they're all out there and then Arn Arn Anderson just uses the term the four horsemen and races the four fingers and all of a sudden the next week people are got the you know acting like there's the raising the four fingers and everything so they they went with it Dusty went with it as his big rivals um but um Ole ran a saw. I remember when we ran a sawmill. Um, he booked uh, he booked WCW for a while, which you know not one of their uh, not one of the good periods of WCW at all. And um, then you know, I mean, it's you know very you know whatever uh, later in his career. Um, I mean, the An the Andersons had a very unique style of wrestling. Um, it was all about working the left arm, um, you know, um, long periods, very much focused on that style of wrestling with the idea that what happens if you take the leg out of a table, it falls down, you know, that type of mentality. And, I mean, it, you know, it worked. They were, they were big, big stars. I mean, you know, you could not do that style today, which isn't to say that it's wrong or bad or anything. It's just, it, you know, and they did the tag team blocks, uh, which nobody does, um, I think everyone could learn a lot from his promos, though. I mean, he looked right in the camera, and he was just, you know, you could, I mean, he would say, like, you could see if you're telling the truth by looking at your eyes. And even though he was just, you know, again, a guy who was, um, you know, cutting a pro, pro wrestling promo, I mean, he did make you believe on his promos. And, I mean, everybody always looks at that promo. He did a deal where um, he turned babyface in, in Georgia when he was the booker. And, um, you know, they, this was after the big program with Dusty. And, um, I think, um, I don't know if it was against Koloff and Smirnoff. I don't remember exactly the turn. Uh, we had gotten Georgia wrestling here like in 79. And then, um, it, we didn't get it on cable for like in 80. And then it came back in 81. So, um, or whatever it was, but, um, during the period when it came back, Ole was a babyface, and 
he, I think it was feuding with Koloff and, and Alexis Smirnoff and Ernie Ladd, I believe as well. And then, um, he would team with, you know, all the baby faces, but, but not Dusty Rhodes, you know, because that was, you know, like another territory, they'd probably have him teaming with Dusty Rhodes three weeks later. But Dusty and Ole, I mean, it was one of those feuds where it was so good that you didn't really, if you like, you were a fan watching that feud, you never wanted him to team up. I mean, one of the things that in, in um, Los Angeles, I remember, when Blassie and Tolis, they had a very famous feud, and then Tolis turns babyface. And, um, you know, Fairly quickly, they put Blassie and Tolis as a team, and nobody wanted to see it because it was just like these guys hate each other. The people believe they hate each other. They would, they could never be friends. He tried to blind Blassie, and then Blassie's, oh, he's not that bad of a guy. And it just, you know, you know, Tolis would, would even told me like nobody wanted us to team. We got over like a fart in church, and um, so. You know, you just kind of wait, but they didn't do it for so long because it, you know, people didn't really want it. Then finally, you know, Dusty Rhodes is in a feud with, um, oh God, it's Ivan Koloff, and I don't remember who the partner was, um, but um, the no, no, it was it was the assassins. It was the assassins. And um, Ivan Ivan Koloff was was a referee, and Gene was a referee, and they had a cage match in Atlanta. And then the match starts, and it's not like this match like they would do now, where you do this twenty minute match, and then all of a sudden everyone turns on Dusty. It's like they get in the cage, and everyone turns on Dusty, and they just beat the hell out of Dusty, every one of them. Koloff's got this big smile on his face. His partner Ole Anderson is back, um, you know jeans you know back there and they're just whatever and then um the the Lars Anderson as a babyface tried to climb the cage when which was a really big moment because it was like Lars team Lars and Ole feuded because Lars was Lars and Ole were a babyface team and then Lars did not turn heel and they did some matches and whatever it was they didn't really do that program but it really was compelling to me because the idea of the two brothers feuding because in wrestling at that time nobody had ever seen that and um and also Lars was a very good promo and Ole was a absolutely fantastic promo so it was almost like the idea of brothers going against each other i always thought was just really like especially then when wrestling is supposed to be more real than it is now I, I always thought that it's, it's like stupid. Brothers aren't going to fight each other to the death or anything like that. And, and, you know, you would never see brothers box each other. It just, you don't do that in combat sport. And, um, but Ole was so obnoxious and such a great heel that you could actually go, you know what? I could see Lars hating him and wanting to fight him. I mean, he was, that's how good Ole was as a heel. And, um, so they all beat Dusty and then, uh, Ole does the promo, and you can probably find it on YouTube. It's one of the most famous promos of all time, where Ole just goes through step by step about you. You have to see it. I could not do it justice, but it was an incredible promo, and it set up everything he did, the entire road to doing it. How disgusted he was to have to team with these baby faces to make it all work. Yeah, yeah, he waited, I think, nine months. Yes. And he goes, like, I was trying to figure out how I could get Dusty to team with me. What could I do to get Dusty to team with me so we could set him up? And then it's like, and then Dusty Rhodes called me like that. He called me, and I go, like, Dusty, let's let's get those guys. Let's get those assassins. Let's get, let's get those guys in a cage match. Let's get Gene as a referee and all this. And he goes, and he fell for it, so, you know. That restarted it, but actually, I mean, the fun, the funny part of that is, as great as that promo was, and I thought, oh my God, they're going to do so, so much business with that promo, and I think they did in the first week, but like they only did about two or three weeks with that program, and then just went in another direction because it just wasn't really knocking them dead, you know. I mean, it was whatever, you know. Well, you know who, who's to say something that's fantastic. Um, at one point isn't seen as fantastic at another point. But uh, I used to talk to Jim Barnett uh, about Ole all the time. I mean, when we did the show, actually, when we did the show on that with, with Ole, Jack Briscoe called me like uh, the next day 
And I knew Jack Briscoe a little bit, and we, I'd done shows with him and, and everything. And he just goes, uh, he just like, calls me up, he starts laughing, and he just goes, Dave, I heard you got to meet Ole Anderson. <laughs> and he said, that's Ole Anderson for you, you know. And when, uh, you know, one of the famous Ole Anderson stories was, so, so Ole was working for Jim Barnett. He was the booker for Jim Barnett. And um, Jim Barnett, at this point, Georgia was a very successful territory in the 70s when Jim Barnett, even probably even before, but Jim Barnett took it over. He had run Australia. Then they'd made some stock deals and everything. There was a big promotional war. The NWA lost all their talent, like virtually everybody except for Bob Armstrong and Daryl Cochran that was working for uh, the Georgia office went to Ann Gunkel's office. So they wanted Eddie Graham and all them. They wanted a dirty player to uh for this promotional war in georgia where all the familiar talent was working for the opposition not the nwa which was very rare at the time unheard of at the time actually and so they and barnett was looking to leave australia at the same time because it was just time and he knew that it was going down and there were some tax laws that had changed and um you know he was very very great success in in australia but it was time to leave, and they made some deals. And originally, um, um, Barnett brought in uh, uh, Jeff, Jerry Jarrett to book. But anyway, at um, it, years later, you know, Ole was Ole became the booker, and they had they had great success. And then after a while, they didn't have such great success. Um, the key being that uh, this is how Barnett always told me was that the. They would run every week at the Atlanta City Auditorium, and it was like a 5,000-seat building. It wasn't that expensive, and Atlanta was their number one profit city in the territory. It carried the territory. The other cities did well as well, but Atlanta was the number one profit every week as the, was the shows at the City Auditorium. And then maybe once a month, every six weeks, they'd go to the Omni, and they'd bring in, you know, Ric Flair, and they'd bring in... Um, Terry Funk and Dory Funk and Jack Briscoe and Andre the Giant and and Dusty would come in more often. You know, Dusty sometimes worked the the City Auditorium, but Dusty always worked the Omni. You know, he'd bring in the big draws and the big cards. And if you ever look back at uh, you know people with those those Omni cards in the seventies, they were freaking loaded cards, and they drew very very well. Well, when the City Auditorium goes down, it gets closed down. The decision is because of the way that the mentality was you run weekly, they would run the Omni every week. Now, the Omni was an expensive building, and you had to draw, you know, um, I, I couldn't tell you exact break even, but I think it's probably about six, 7,000, and they were averaging about five. So they were losing money in Atlanta, their number one market. And, um, you know, and in time, you know, and Jim was used to living like a king on as the president of the company he had his chauffeur he had his private chef he had his expensive apartment he had his giant telephone bills because he was a big gossip and the company started losing money so Ole um checked the books and everything like this and confronted barnett and basically said that he was going to go to the police and um turn him in for embezzlement and barnett had a very good reputation in town i mean he was on jimmy carter you know um what's it called the uh committee for the arts or something like that um you know and um he was at carter's inauguration in a in a better seat than bob hope and just you know he was very well known around town as this artsy guy and so he just goes, oh, can I just have a title? I won't work. I won't even take a paycheck, but I just want to keep a title. And he goes, no, he goes, you got to get out or I'm going to, you know, basically turn you into the police and you're going to go. You're, you're gone. So Barnett, you know, rather than be turned in, onto the police for embezzlement, um, uh, you know, left. Ole got in charge of the company. Uh, Barnett ended up obviously going to work for Vince McMahon at that point uh, or very shortly after and was a key in Vince McMahon's national expansion. So this is like the 80s now. And then um, so Ole is running the company and his theory was because the company had been losing money 
that the best way to break even was to stop using big stars. So he used a much lower level of talent and it kind of worked in the sense that, um, you know, they were losing less money. In fact, they were even making money, um, even though they were drawing much less. So um, there were various stockholders, and obviously Jack and Jerry Briscoe um, were two of the key stockholders. And they basically saw this as a no-win situation. They saw that, that costs were going to go up. Vince was going was going all over the country. And yes... Um, the pro they were they were no longer losing money, but the profits were small, and they were getting no dividends. You know, I mean, it's like yeah, they were breaking even, but these guys, you know, they were used to getting these dividend checks, you know, based on the profits. And then for a while there were no profits, and then after a while they were, um, you know, basically Ole had a big salary at this point. I think he was making like one hundred twenty five thousand a year, which you know in the uh, early eighties was a a big salary. And um, the Briscoes were just like, oh, he's making all this money and we're stockholders. We got a percentage and we're making no money. And the future isn't good because Vince is coming. So they went and contacted Vince and said, you know, we want to sell. And Vince was just like, well, if you can, can you get me, if you can get me 50%, we can buy the company, you know? And it wasn't that Vince wanted to buy Georgia Championship Wrestling at all. He had no interest in that. But Georgia Championship Wrestling was on TBS, the Superstation, and it was the number one rated television show on cable at the time. So getting that time slot was, it was a double for Vince. Number one, you get, you know, the number one station broadcasting wrestling in the traditional time slot. That's, you know, been a cable hit for years um, all over the country. And this is in 84 when Vince is just getting his expansion going. And number two, you get the leading opposition on cable television with the NWA, with the exposure for Ric Flair and all that. Um, you know, you, you take that off the board and Vince between USA and um, TBS, Vince was basically going to be in control of all the major cable outlets nationally. So he, while he didn't have an, a, a monopoly, he had a monopoly of national television at a very key time in the history of wrestling. So the Briscoes and some of the other shareholders, Jim Oates, um, Dark Side of the Ring is actually going to be doing a, a, a series on that that will probably explain everything. But um, Ole was the general manager, and he was a stockholder in the company, and he had no idea any of this was coming. They went behind his back, and they had about uh, whatever it was. It was over 50%. It's like maybe whatever the number was, but it was a majority. They sold the majority to Vince. Then Vince comes to TV to take over. Ole has no idea what's going on and finds out that his company's been sold. And it's very rare that, like, you can sell a company without, you know, because it wasn't just Ole. There were other shareholders that didn't go with the Briscoes, and they were also blindsided. So it was like, it's like you you're, you own a company and it's being sold and you don't even know it's being sold. They had these clandestine meetings and everything that you would think of. So Vince got uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling and he got the time slot. Well, there were so many complaints at the time from um, wrestling fans when they saw WWF on Georgia Championship Wrestling um, or World Championship Wrestling. I mean, they did not... Want, they wanted Gordon Soley, they wanted Wrestling 2, they wanted Tommy Rich, they wanted Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, of course. You know, they wanted their wrestlers. They didn't want freaking Hulk Hogan and these guys. So there were so many complaints, which would, and Ted heard them and gave Ole uh, like a 7 a.m. early morning time slot, which did decent numbers at that time, actually. And Ole started up Championship Wrestling from Georgia and ran it for a year. It did not do well, uh, didn't have much talent other than the Road Warriors, who Ole, to his credit, you know, I mean, I talked about Steamboat that he didn't see talent in and, and a lot of people who he didn't see talent in, like Savage and Hogan and Bobby Heenan, which is another story. Um, you know, Bobby Heenan hated Ole because um, when uh, Bobby Heenan was managing in Georgia and, um, you know, Ole goes, you know, like, you should buy a house here. 
He goes, I don't want to buy a house here because, you know, wrestlers, you know, you go from place to place. And he just goes, no, goes, go buy a house here because uh, you're going to be here for forever, you know, like that. And so he buys a house and then whatever it was, a month or two later, Ole fires him. So, you know, that'll, that'll tell you why Bobby Heenan didn't like Ole Anderson. But um, going back to uh, the thing, so where he lost the company was a year or so later when Ted was about to kick Vince off the station. Ratings were falling. Um, and, you know, he was he had been talking to Watts about bringing in Mid-South and Mid-South came in and did bigger ratings than Vince on the station, which was a total embarrassment because Vince is telling everyone that he's got the greatest wrestling and, you know, then some company that, you know, with, with that Bill Watts is running is outdrawing him in the ratings in a, in, even though Vince has the traditional time slot, but as, as it all shakes out, um, Barnett, who was working for Vince, went to Crockett and they made, made a deal where Crockett would pay Vince a million dollars for the time slot. So Crockett got the time slot at that point, since it's the NWA, and since the Ole's company was not doing well or anything like that, it was, you know, basically Crockett's taken over the time slot, and the championship wrestling from Georgia ceased to exist. And then Ole went back to wrestling, and, you know, as a heel for Crockett, starred the Four Horsemen, had a little run afterwards, um, then left. Came back one last time in 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 eighty nine ninety. It was tag team with um, for a couple of years actually with with Arn Anderson, and um, you know got hurt working with the Steiners, and that was pretty much the end of his career. But he worked, you know, training and booking and different things for World Championship Wrestling for many many years afterwards, and uh, you know ah that's kind of it i don't know you got any other questions about Ole? because i could i could write a book on Ole. Be- being that i memorized his freaking book before we did that show you know i'm good i mean we can get questions from the uh listeners and go over some more of these r- later on in the week but yeah. uh i presume friday we will have a uh big bio coming up in the observer well, we'll definitely do a bio on Ole. i mean he was a very significant player you know when the andersons were a I mean, a very significant team in the Carolinas and Georgia. And Ole had a nice run in Florida in the early 70s. Um, Ole had a chance to come to San Francisco and almost came. Um, Shires was going to make Ole and Gene World Tag Team Champions. This would be about 73. And then he decided not to come. Um, But, you know, I mean, he could have come here, come to California. You know, went to Japan. Um, Didn't go to a lot of places. He mostly stayed in the Carolinas most of the time and and you know it was a good place to work early on because um i mean it's a hard 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 schedule you got to work a lot of days but crockett senior and junior paid their talent the top talent main event talent well um and they could stay there for years and their kids could go to school and there was there was advantages you know in a lot of territories you know you could make money but you were like wwf if you were a heel you know i mean you could do very well there for six months to nine months then you had to leave you know um other places like awa um and the carolinas that kept the terror you know the talent stayed there a lot longer you know florida people would come you had your your homesteaders you know that were there for years but a lot of the talent would come and go and come and go and you know dallas they'd come and go but uh, Crockett had his crew of guys, and uh, Ole was one of them. And, and uh, they stayed, for the most part, you know, again, he would go to Georgia to freshen up. Um, and those territories, again, the Georgia and the Carolinas were very close in a lot of ways. And, um, so, you know, Ole was, uh, yeah, Ole was a, a, a real character. And he had definitely had some, he definitely had a lot of enemies at the end. That's for sure. Um, everybody, you know, at the end, you know, if you talk to any of the younger wrestlers, um, boy, they all had Ole stories. You know, Ole trying to basically teach him to work 1970s wrestling in 1980, in the 1980s, and just thought that was the only wrestling that worked. I mean, it was, it's, you know, it's it's a broken record, you know. I mean, it's like that has happened to many, many people, and, and that's what happened Ole Anderson in the 80s, 
and 90s especially, actually in the 90s more than the 80s. Ole Anderson in the 90s trying to have everyone do that, you know, you know, don't do flying, don't don't go off your feet, you know. Roddy Piper actually though though learned from Ole, you know. The reason that you if you ever watched Roddy in in WWE even though he's a smaller guy, he didn't bump a lot was because Ole said that like, you know, Ole's version is is is, is that you wanted it to be a fight, so you didn't want to take many bumps. You know, you didn't really, you know, you don't take, if you want to be a heel, you're a bully, and you don't really want to take a, a back step until maybe the end of the match. So it was a different, very different style as people wanted bigger, you know, bigger moves and bigger stuff and everything like that and and more back and forth Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat stuff. You know, the Oli stuff, you know, it was just, but Oli still tried to, to wanted everyone to do it that way because, you know, he just, he felt that, this is what worked and this is what draws money and and stopped watching and you know when vince did the stuff like when he was on the show and he's you know vince is you know you know they can't sell tickets or anything like that with what they do and it's like dude you know they're bigger than than you guys ever were but you know what are you gonna do when that's what are you gonna do on the uh, weekend show, we talked about the Australia show and what appeared to be new matches for Mania. And as it turns out, those are new matches for WrestleMania. Yeah, yeah. On the books right now, the um, LA Knight, AJ Styles, and, and Randy Orton, Logan Paul are, are on the books. And something's going on. I mean, and I, I'll probably get a clarification tomorrow. I had heard of Gunther and Sami Zayn. But when I watched the show tonight, it felt to me like they're, you know, it was very clear. It, it felt, felt to like, me like they're doing a multi-person night one, and the winner gets Gunther night two. It could be that. Um, so maybe that isn't what, what they're going to do. Or it just could be like a multi-person match, you know, where the, um, you know, because they had Chad Gable. Gunther mentioned R-Truth and The Miz. Yes, I think everybody Gable that doesn't Sam- have a program for Mania is probably doing some battle royal or... I, I would presume a battle royal. I don't think that they would do. Well, I guess they could do a battle royal, but that's too. That you could do it. I mean, they, they you know they do they do the Andre battle royal. They try but, and get everybody on the show one way or the other. What's Miz going to do in Mania? Yeah, I mean, well, the last last couple of years, the Andre battle royal has been on SmackDown. Well, hey, maybe it'll be so, on SmackDown. Yeah, but I mean, Gunther was. Uh, I mean, he seemed to be programmed with a lot of different people um, on the show, um, so. Yeah, and then um, oh geez, so yeah, that was uh, that was the one thing um, on tonight's show, and Cody, you know, uh, issued a challenge to a singles match for The Rock, and that will be discussed on Friday. So I don't know if they're getting away from the tag and going to a singles, or it's just a setup for the tag. Um, I was just told to stay tuned because it's all going to play out. Originally, it was the tag, um, but, yeah, Cody, he definitely made a challenge for singles, and they said that The Rock is going to answer it on Friday. So something's going down uh, in that in that direction this week. Nick Kaniski did a, an interview with uh, Pollock and Thurston and talked about how he had been propositioned uh, many times during his WWE E WWF, WWF career by Terry Garvin. He, he, he was he was actually only there for a relatively short period of time, less than a year. Um, so that story was not unfamiliar. I mean, I, I remember first hearing that story from Larry Matisik, who had heard from Gene, who, had, who was of course very close with Gene Kaniski, and um, you know was one of the all time great wrestlers. Um, and Nick was his, his son, and Nick was a tough guy. And, uh, you know, um, call it very good college wrestler and got into pro wrestling, was thought to have pretty good potential, good look and all that. And um, had worked a few places and then went to WWF in 86. He'd not been wrestling for, for very long, but it was number one. He's Gene's son, which, you know, to some people meant a lot um, and also more, you know, um, you know, they, they, he had a look, and they thought that he had a, a shot. And so he went to um, he went there, and they basically did a thing when he first came is he would work. 
they didn't have a developmental program then. So if you had, were a young guy who was maybe not ready for national television, um, what they would do, and they did this with Owen Hart, they did it with Ultimate Warrior, Tom McGee, many, many others. You bring a guy in, younger guy, you send him on the road, have him work with veterans, you know, and do arena matches, and then sink or swim. If they get over, fine. If they don't get over, that's what happens. Um, then you don't. So he was not on TV, but he was working there, and apparently, you know, the the one thing, um, Rene Goulet told him that, uh, you know, you, you, you know, this guy, he was not fat, but you know how those guys looked in the 80s. They were all roided up, and they were all shredded. Not all shredded, but that's... If you were a big name or you had, you know, you were Sergeant Slaughter or something, you didn't have, you didn't have to be shredded. But if you were Nick Kaniski to get a push there, you know, probably had to get on steroids and get shredded. So Rene Goulet went to him and just goes, you know, you got you to gotta get shredded. You got to lose weight, you know. And he this was not a fat person. And um, so whatever. And then, um, yeah, Terry Garvin, he said that Terry Garvin hit on him. And he said no, and you know, um, said that you know, promised that he if he did it, he would get a big push. Didn't do it. Same story as Jim Powers said. It's the exact same story, pretty much. Didn't get a big push. Um, was there for a while. Uh, finally, complained to Vince. He said, and Vince said he would take care of it, and. Garvin was still hitting on him, and, you know, he wasn't fired or anything, but he was, you know, losing, you know, losing most of his matches by this point. And I'm not saying, see, it's one of those rest, it's one of those weird things because you can go and say, see, this is what happened. But I will say that Nick Kaniski, it was like, I didn't, I, it's, like, it's like, I didn't, like some guys, you'll you, you if you watch and you'll just go like this guy deserves like this big push. Why is he not getting it? And with Nick Kaniski, I you know watching at that time, I never felt that. I just thought this is probably the level the guy should be. Now, if he had done it with Garvin, would they have pushed him more? You know, it's like you never know. You never know. Um, and but it's it's a horrible situation to put people in. And we've heard enough stories from enough people at this point in time where the credibility more and more completely is 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 you know especially when it comes to Terry Garvin the credibility is 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 very much that these stories are real and Vince knew about it Vince let it happen i remember when um but Joe Paterno the Joe Paterno thing came out and i was so s surprised because having covered wrestling and Vince McMahon and knowing the stories you know, th that were very similar. And Joe Paterno was like a god. And Vince McMahon was like, you know, just Vince McMahon, wrestling promoter. I mean, they wanted Joe Paterno to run for governor and everything like that. And Joe Paterno was totally taken down, statue removed and everything, and, and should have been over this. And I was like, why didn't they just pay everybody off like Vince would do? And, you know, but the what, what the difference was, was that... Joe Paterno, because he coached college football and was a, a famous college football coach, one of the greatest coaches of all time, the media, you know, went hard, hard, hard after that story. It was a horrible story. The, the Paterno story was a horrible story, too. Um, with Vince, you know, it's just wrestlers. It's fake wrestlers and, you know, ha, ha, ha. You know, that's what happens in fake wrestling. They, they had no respect, so there was no scrutiny. And Vince, you know, whatever, you know, I mean, Vince let it happen. Vince was aware, you know, I mean, what was going through his mind? He's all powerful, you know, and no one's going to tell him what to do. And Nick Kaniski, again, you know, this, this story is not somebody coming out of the blue saying something that people didn't know. We knew that story. And Nick Kaniski had, had told the story to other people and he had, uh, Many, many years ago, he told the story to Greg Oliver, but he asked Greg Oliver that, you know, he didn't want to go public with it and he didn't want it out. And then, you know, this week, you know, he did the interview um, with uh, John Pollock and Brandon Thurston and he 
I guess for whatever reason, he's 62 years old, 63 years old, and um, I think 62, and he was just like, I guess he was just wanted it out at this time. Maybe he fi he figured my life is at a certain point, and and you know whatever you know maybe you know when you're when you've got other jobs and you're working your way through, um, you know maybe you don't want Vince's lawyers coming after you, um, trying to ruin your reputation, you know for for telling the truth and things like that. And now maybe with Vince in the situation he's in, he felt that. There's no Jerry McDivitt, and he can say it, and he's not going to have to deal with all the negativity from it and all the wrestlers burying him for being a bitter guy who never made it. So he said it. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's another story, and it was allowed to happen. And then the, the final confrontation, um, so he's on a road, on a tour, and... You know, it's like one of those weekend tours, and it's like, let's just say, um, it was it was like Toronto and um, I forgot the other city, Landover, Maryland, I think. Um, so he's he's working on this tour, and then they pull him from a show on the tour. So it's like he's, let's say he's, you're working Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So he's pulled from the Saturday show for no reason, just probably, you know, Garvin fucking with him or whatever. Um, and so... Um, he doesn't get paid when in those days, you know, you got paid based on working. So he's on the road and he's got this day and he's not getting paid. So he was very upset that he was booked, taken off the show in the middle of a tour and didn't get paid. So he complained to Vince about it and basically, you know, told Vince that and go, OK, that's it. Um, from now on, you know, it's just like I'm not, you know, and he was doing jobs most of the time at this point. Um no more jobs, you know, and um, if if someone wants to beat me, they're going to have to beat me, you know. And there's there were very few wrestlers on that roster that would have had a shot at him, very few. And and plus, the, what do you want? A, a real fight in the, in a wrestling match? I mean, that's the worst thing in the world. So so Vince fired him, you know. And he goes, "I'll finish up my my, my I'll finish up my book dates." And Vince goes, "No, you're done right now." And that was it for Nick Kaniski in WWF, and he. Um, he wrestled for AWA with Kevin Kelly, magnificent Kevin Kelly, um, with Medusa as their manager. But, you know, he was out of wrestling a couple of years later. And um, apparently at this point in his life, he's very grateful that he never made it in pro wrestling because he's seen what happened to a lot of the pro wrestlers of his era. And he said he's lived a great life. So that's the Nick Kaniski story. But it's like another one. And, you know, I mean, it's it's a it's. You know, when people talk about the roots of the company and everything like that, I mean, it's been there. It's been there forever, forever, you know, as far as, you know, that that type of stuff that was allowed to happen under Vince that happened under his watch. He did know about it. People complained to him about it. He did nothing about it. Um, that was in, the, you know, this stuff is in the 80s, but it's a pattern and, um, you know. You know, people, you know, when they when they talk about the rot in that company and it institutionalized and all that, that's true. It really was institutionalized. I mean, it's, these are stories long ago, not stories now. But um, obviously, you know, with Janelle Grant, that story is not that long ago. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those, it's just the reality of, of that company under Vince McMahon, you know, for all those years. So latest on the uh, Kung Lee lawsuit. Well, they are starting, um, both sides are talking, and it looks like uh, they're going to negotiate a settlement, or they're going to try. I mean, the last thing, I mean, you you know, obviously, TKO, TKO does not want this thing going to court. I mean, a bad verdict, you know, not number one, a bad verdict could cost them, like, with, with, you know, legitimately a billion dollars, and that's a lot of money. And the the more important thing is is that a bad verdict opens WWF up to the WWE up, to, so it opens TKO up to a second suit over WWE. So the la they they cannot afford this. They cannot afford the second suit. They cannot afford the risk of going in front of a jury. Um, the Kung Lee Kung Lee's lawyers and everything like that. Um, we'll see. They've got them. They've got them under a barrel. But you know you don't. 
you know, court going to court's very expensive. The the case is supposed to go in April, and um, you know we're getting near April, and um, they have to reach a settlement. And um, I think it's going to be a high dollar, very very high dollar settlement. Um, if they can reach it, they go to court. You know, now you're rolling the dice because the jury also could could just go. These guys sign contracts, and you know there's no. Um, you know, there's no law that says you have to pay talent a certain percentage of your your money just because they do it in boxing or baseball or whatever. There's, you know, then UFC didn't and WWE doesn't. There's no law that says that you have to. You know that that the owners that the owners can't make ridiculous profits and and take out big dividends every year and just be filthy rich. I mean, it's like, you know, you can get mad at them for doing it, but it's not, it's perfectly legal, I think. So, um, I mean, we'll have to wait and see, see how it plays out. But, uh, yeah, they, they, today, uh, they told the court that they are, um, in, uh, talks, both sides. So we'll see how it goes. All right, in a week, the New Japan Cup is going to kick off March 6th at the anniversary show, and we have 28 wrestlers announced for the tournament, and they are Sonata, Yoshihashi, Kenta, Shota Umino, Toru Yano, Yujiro. Jack Perry, Miss Jack Perry. Uh, he's on the list here. TJP, David Finley, Tangaloa, Great Okan, Ishii, Chase Owens, Goto, Evil, Hikaleo, Bolton Oleg, Shingo, Yuya Uimura, Callum Newman, Gabe Kidd, Yoda Suji, Jeff Cobb, El Fantasmo, Mikey Nichols, Taichi, Ren Narita, Zack Saber Jr., and yes, Dave, the big one at the end, Jack Perry. Yeah, no Matt Jack Riddle. Perry. Yeah, no Matt Riddle. Matt Riddle no, was Matt Riddle. Uh, yeah, Matt Riddle was originally on the uh, the list. Um, not not it was never announced, but uh, he was booked for this thing, and I don't know, you know, whatever they. Either they made a decision or he made a decision, but he's not there. Um, so the first round, I mean, there's um, Sonata and Goto and Evil and Zack Sabre Jr. were given buys for reasons they just were. So the first round is Kenta and Yoshihashi, which is something. Jack Perry and Umino, which obviously they have been building, which is an interesting match. Toriyano and Yujiro, which probably will not be a great match. David Finley and TJP, who had a match in San Jose that was very, very good. Um, much better than I thought. Not that, you know, I mean, I know they're both really good, but they really gelled great. Tangaloa uh, and Great Okan. Tangaloa is not great in singles matches. Ishii and Chase Owens. Um, eh, you know, Ishii does always have great matches. Hikaleo and Oleg Bolton, which is, um, you know, obviously Hikaleo is going to win. Uh, Shingo Takagi and Yuya Uemura, which is probably the best first-round match. Although Gabe Kidd and Callum Newman might be up there as well because they are so underrated. Callum Newman, the guy is is great, great, and so is Gabe Kidd. Yoda Suji and Jeff Cobb, which should be good. Fantasmo and Mikey Nichols and Ren Narita and Taichi. So um, the winner will face Naito on um in april and uh, for the iwgp championship and uh there you go i mean um you know there's there's a bunch of potential winners i don't think sonata would be one of them since he just lost for the championship and then i look at some of the others like who would i want to see i could see finley i don't i don't you know umino and jack perry is an interesting one because the winner could go pretty far um but I could see Finley as a as a winner. Um, Evil, God, you know he's got Evil's got the Never Belt, so maybe that he won't win because of that. Shingo Takagi, um, you know, like like Naito and Shingo Takagi because they're in the same stable, it'd be kind of interesting. But I don't think they would do it. Uemura, I could see he just lost his hair, so I could see them like you know like giving him a big push from losing his hair. And then uh, Suji, of course. You know, talked about how he's another one who could win it. And Zack Sabre. So I think those guys are the favorites. But we'll see. All right. Uh, Casey Katechi. You saw the match? Oh, yeah. they had So so he's uh, he's like this this pop star. 
in uh, Japan. Kind of like a Logan Paul thing in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know enough about Japanese culture to know like where they would compare, but uh, he wrestled for DDT yesterday and everyone's been talking about this match. It's, it was in a six man tag. And um, he, what a natural, you know, it's like watching like Kurt Angle or, or Logan Paul. I mean, the guy was, the guy is, he's a, he's a, a phenomenal athlete. I mean, that's the one thing I could tell, like just balance and, and like he's, you know, he's green. It's his first match, but he's so much better than, you know, most first match guys, you know, all but a few first match guys that I've ever seen. And, um, yeah, you know, and, and the place, you know, they were Cork and Hall and they were packed with women. I mean, it was just women. It was, it was like watching a freaking Von Erich, you know, in, in the eighties, um, with the way, you know, the sound of the audience and was that, that women's sound, you know, that you don't really get much in modern pro wrestling. But I remember from going to Dallas, you know, my ears would be ringing because they screamed so loud and these people were screaming loud, you know, I mean, the same in, same, at the All Japan Women's Show, when I used to go to the All Japan Women's Show, same thing. But um, he's got a great look. He's a really good-looking guy who's, you know, um, um, you know, good body, good. I mean, like, man, you know, it's like he he would be like, like if this guy, you know, got into pro wrestling full time. Um, I mean, I could see him being a freaking superstar. Um, He's got everything, um, charisma. I mean, just uh, God for a guy in a first match. What an impression! And everyone, everyone who's seen it says the same thing. You know, just um, you know, um, really, really, he, he could be really, really special. But he may not. You know, it could be like D'Angelo Williams. You know, a guy who goes in there in his first match, good body and everything, looks like he could be really something, and it's not for him. And with you know. And this was just a guy doing it for fun. You know, it's not like uh, it's not like he's he was planning on working for DDT a lot. He just did it for fun. But uh, very, very, you know, you know, Drew um, got a lot of potential as a draw. I mean, he reminded me a lot of um, the, the women drawing and everything of when um, K1 Max with Masato, when Masato was like that big. He had that same same kind of face. He's got the bleach blonde hair. Masato didn't have bleach blonde hair, but same kind of like movie star face. Um, that Masato had, and Masato was a big, big, big draw with women um, during his heyday. Kaisei Takechi, by the way. Yes. Yes. All right, uh, before we uh, go to Raw, what's the update on TNA plans? Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, one of the things that they've been looking at is, uh, and this is not going to happen anytime soon, but um, they want to go live. Um, the idea is to go live and have like a location, you know what I mean, where they would go every Thursday in, um, you know, in Full Sail University is one of the places that they've talked about. Um, and there's probably other locations as well, which would be really tough because, you know, like uh, Orlando already has NXT every Tuesday. But Scott Demore, before he was ousted, Scott Demore and Lou D'Angeli went to, um, and Ed Nordholm went to Full Sail and scouted it out, and, and that's where they wanted to go. You know, because the one thing with Full Sail, if you remember it, 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 it has a great look for television for a, you know, 300, 400 seat building. Um, you know, because a lot of those, you know, like a lot of the buildings of that size, you know, they don't really look good for TV. So um, and there's some cost savings because, you know, you can do what what NXT did, you know, where you can have the students, you know, work on the shows um, and it gives them work and it gives them work experience. So there's that, and it's something that on campus, you know, you can let the students in free. And, you know, I mean, I, I thought Full Sail and NXT was a big success. You know, I mean, they obviously, you know, made the move not to go back after the pandemic for whatever reason, I don't really know. But, um, yeah, they that's that was talked about. Of course, Scott Demore is not there anymore, but Full Sail is still one of the locations they're talking about. But the idea, the idea was under Demore and you know it may be delayed it may not some of the talent knows about this um would be maybe a few test runs towards the end of the year and then you know the the, the mentality was live 2025 and of course 
with Demore not there, they may you know they may also scrap that idea because it's obviously a lot more expensive to run live every week than to tape you know in different cities um, where you can sell some tickets. Although they don't sell a lot of tickets, but um, you know if you run if you're going to run every single Thursday night at Full Sail University. I mean, you're not you're going to have to give those tickets away for free because it's not like people are going to, you know, pay for for tickets um, in that city every single Thursday night. And that's not happening. So um, but that was, yeah, it's one of the ideas that that was being worked on. And uh, we'll see. I don't know how much of a difference that makes live versus um, I mean, it's more exciting for the wrestlers. You know, there would be more. I mean, I think there'd be a little bit more talk. But you're still talking, you know, the number three promotion and one that doesn't really have, um, you know, that doesn't really have that that thing that makes people, you know, people buy a lot of tickets to the show. You know, I mean, number two is, is struggling to sell tickets right now. Um, but, I mean, would it help TV ratings to go live for TNA? You know, I don't know because, you know, I don't know. I would not picture it being a big difference maker. Well, on that station, it's not going to be a big difference maker because it's a weak state. It's it's a weak station. You know, your your upper limits on that station are are very low. But I mean, as far as buzz on the company, doing live angles and things like that, I mean, there's more uh, risk. Um, you know, when you when you're not taping of something botching, but. You know, at TNA tapings, they got a lot of pros working there, and that usually really doesn't happen. I, I don't really hear about, oh, God, botched up stuff. They got to retape it. I mean, it happens, but it's not that often. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, there's excitement. There's, there's more excitement when you're going live. But again, is it worth the extra cost for a company that's obviously trying to keep costs low? So we'll see. All right, uh, we've got Raw to talk about here before we go, and there was a lot of talking on this show. It was a very promo-heavy show, and it opened up with a Rhea Ripley promo talking about uh, defending her title successfully at the pay-per-view, and then Becky came out, and they basically just did a back and forth. They're squaring off at WrestleMania, and Becky said that Rhea was great, but... She was a Grand Slam champion, best-selling author. She can do it all, including beating Rhea Ripley. And Rhea essentially told her, you know, behind every great man is a greater woman. And I am not behind you. I am always on top. So she leaves. And then who should return but Nia Jax? And she attacks Becky. And she lays her out. She's going for a finish. Adam Pearce threatens to find her. All of the people come down to break it up. And that led to Nia doing a promo and challenging Liv Morgan for later. And then as we find out, we are going to get that Becky Lynch and Nia Jax match next week. We had to have it. Which I figured they were going to do on the road to WrestleMania because Nia did beat her clean a couple yeah, of months they have back. To do, they have to do it. And and Becky Lynch has to beat her. Yeah. It's the, uh, the more things change. It's the typical WWE booking. If you're getting a championship match at WrestleMania, you must go through a giant the month for WrestleMania, and Becky's doing that next week. Yeah. We had Shinsuke Nakamura and Sami Zayn, and uh, they went through two commercial breaks. They had a long match, and the first, I'd say two-thirds, it was all right, kind of just there, but it got much better it there actually, at the end. It actually only went 15 minutes, but they had like seven minutes of commercial time during that 15 minutes. Yes. I mean, they when they went to the second commercial, it was only, like the second commercial was only eight minutes into the match. And I was going, like, we're going to a second break already? It was like they, they went, like, only, like, four minutes, and yeah. then they went to another break. So he just got hit with Kinshasa after Kinshasa, kicked out, got his foot on the ropes, and finally Nakamura goes for another one. Sammy avoids it, hits a kick to the back of the head, second one to the front of the face for the pin, and, man, the shot of him getting that boot to the face of Nakamura in the corner, they showed a replay. It looked awesome. And Sami Zayn gets the win. I got to say... There's a lot of stuff that Lee Fitting is doing with that show that is really good. I mean, as far as it's 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 all little things, um, but it's it just makes it 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 sports ideas, you know, like you know, again, like you see the people coming to the buildings like you would like a UFC fight or a boxing match or whatever. Um, certain shots, uh, the Telstrator that Pat McAfee's doing, but they're really trying to. 
you know, give it more of a sports feel. And I think um, I think it's so much better than what Kevin Dunn was doing. Well, yeah, it is because yeah. his his product was uh, he stayed around way too long. Many people, that. many people did there. Yes. I mean, that was Vince, too. You know, I mean, the greatest thing that ever happened was Vince being gone. I mean, like if there was no scandals and there was no Janelle Grant, I mean, the reality is, is Vince would be in charge of creative and. You know, A.W. would probably be doing a whole hell of a lot better. They would better. be doing way better. <laughs> they would be and, doing a Hey, all scandals aside, I mean, if you look at just from a booking standpoint, he should have been out of there in the mid-2010s because it started going downhill bad in oh, yeah. 2018. I remember bad. that. I remember, I think even earlier than that, because I remember I would watch, and this has got to be before 2018, I remember watching those shows where I would go like, this is this is just bad. These Raws. Yeah, they were terrible. But it was 2018 where they started seeing the declines, the massive year over year declines. Yeah, because it was they were, so they bad. Were, they were declining. They were declining. They were declining every year when cable was still growing, and then, um, you know, then you know, like the last year, obviously, that's kind of been bucking the trend. And even if the trend is, even if they're like they're even, um, or you go like like SmackDown this week was down from last year. Or this, although it was essentially the same in 18 to 49, but it was down in viewers. You know, the reality is, is like, you know, how hot are they? I mean, San Jose sold out. I mean, it's the third straight TV sellout. Their house show business hasn't been this good since 2002. I mean, their, you know, overall business, their overall business is going to be the biggest business year that they've ever done. You know, even throwing out, and I mean, even if you take out all the TV rights, because obviously it's the TV rights that, by the way, tomorrow they're going to be announcing all their numbers. But, but if even if you take all the TV rights out, they're still doing more business than they've ever done. And we had uh, Nia doing a promo talking about Lib Morgan. Actually, we talked about that already. Chelsea came out for a promo and said she'd issued a complaint to management. She was doing this match in protest, buried Raquel Rodriguez. Raquel came out, beat her in like a minute. Just uh to Hano Bomb. That was the end of that. Yeah, yeah, Nothing yeah, 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 yeah. Right at right at a minute, yeah, yeah. Then we had a Sammy promo backstage where he once again said, I believe I could be a contender champion. I believe there's a path to mania. And then up walked Gunther. They had a stare down, Gunther laughed, walked off. And so I do expect I think if they do the battle royal, Sammy wins and it's Sammy and Gunther. That's do you think Sammy wins the title? Yeah, actually, I do too. I think Sammy beats Gunther. Yeah, I think I think I think it's time. Yep. So, yeah. Cody came out to do a promo. Actually, he was backstage doing a promo, and he said he couldn't wait to hear Rock's response on Friday's SmackDown, and then plugged the main event of this show, which was in fact it actually wasn't because they did an angle afterwards, but Cody Rhodes versus Grayson Waller. Scheduled uh, to be the main event of the show. Yeah. Imperium came out to cut a promo, and that's when uh, Gunther was mentioning all of these different people he could potentially face: Sami Zayn, Chad Gable, Miz, R Truth. Yeah, those were the names. Those were the names that he brought up. Yeah. So Judgment Day's music hits, and they come out for a long talking segment, and essentially they told Gunther that uh, we're going to be leaving Mania with all the belts, and that includes your. Intercontinental title, and he wants to know who's going to be. And Dom steps up, and he says, "When we say we're going to do something, we mean it. That means that title belongs to us." So Gunther just looks at him and he shoves him. Priest gets angry. They have a big, like both sides hold each other apart, and uh, Judgment Day ends up leaving. So well, well, no, nobody's really holding Gunther back that much. Well, he's just standing there. They're holding Priest back. I mean, they were holding Priest back, yeah. I mean, they seem to set up Gunther against both Dominic and Priest. Yeah, I think it's going to be a multi-person. Yeah. Probably a battle royal. So after the break, Rhea goes up to Dom and says, of all people, you go after Gunther. And he says, don't worry, I got this. And she kind of storms off. And Finn says, you better go smooth this over. Okay, question. Why didn't she say to Priest? Because Priest was the one who was going after Gunther, too. Yeah, but Dom was the one that stepped up. Like, Gunther says, like, who's going to step up? And it was was Dom. yeah, yeah. So then uh, he goes to leave, and he runs into Andrade. And he says, oh, man, hey, Andrade, you know, how you doing? Uh, and Andrade says, I'm here to have a meeting to discuss my first opponent. Maybe I'll see you soon. It seemed to be a hint. It sure did. Dom says, all right, I'll talk to you after a while. Well, if they do that, though, Andrade has to beat him, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. New Day Imperium Street Fight. As far as Street Fight uh, go, this is pretty good. I mean, you know, they did all the usual spots. They had the table that somebody went through that people weren't expecting. They had the kendo sticks. They had the chair shots and everything. And then at the end, Kofi goes through the forgotten table outside. Kaiser throws Wood through a chair in the corner, pulls the jeans, even though it's a Street Fight, no DQ, and he gets the pin. You know, one thing that happened, and it happened in this match when Vinci hit, um, I believe it was Woods, right, with a really hard chair shot, and I've been seeing it in AEW. I mean, for whatever reason, like for a long time, like chair shots to the head were were pretty much verboden in American wrestling, but man, between New Japan and AEW and, and that chair shot here, I mean, it feels like that they are... Uh, you know, they're kind of getting back to the old chair shots to the head, which is, I don't know the possibility. Well, let's cut it out. I hope, I hope so. I don't, I, I don't like seeing chair shots to the head. No. I mean, I just think that it's, um, just, you know, I mean, I know that there's other ways to get concussions and all that. And, you know, but, you know, the, we really need to learn. I mean, the thing is, it's, it's like there were so many wrestlers. And and Oli, you know, was another one. I mean, Oli Oli was suffering from dementia too, you know. At the end, um, it's it's like so many wrestlers when when you know at the end of their lives were suffering from so many problems. And I know it's not just chair shots to the head. And I think that like in that era, I think one of the issues in that era was that guys would get concussions and then they would work the next night. You know, they didn't take time off, and then they would get worse and worse and things like that. And now. In theory, when you have a concussion, you take t- time off. Um, if you're diagnosed with one, you have to until you can pass the test and everything like that. But um, yeah, I I don't know. I don't I don't see chair shots to the head as a positive. Then we had Adam Pierce getting a call from Bronson, which we don't know anything about. But uh, Chad he, Gable walked he, in. He congratulated me. I, I figured Bronson might be another one in that match. Yep. Yep. And he said, uh, Chad said, listen, I'm not, I'm not here just fighting for the belt. I'm fighting for my family. Gunther beat me. He also brought my daughter to tears. So it's not just about a title. It means a lot more to me. And Pierce says, I'll give it some thought. Yeah. None of these guys were, because this was, this was Brock Lesnar's match. Yeah. Yeah. None of the, I mean, none of this, none of this was, was planned out in advance, even though it's interesting because, like with with Chad Gable, it's like you look at it now and you go, "Oh, see, they were always doing this story." You know what I mean? Yeah, but they weren't. I mean, they they still could have, you know, done the plan where we're going to do this battle royal, and the winner will get whoever wins the main event at some point down the road. They could have called it like a number one contenders match or something. Even if Brock I think had I think I think if it was I think it was if it was Brock, I think they were just going to go with that match and advertise that match. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, they could have advertised Brock Lesnar versus Gunther, and then yeah. on the undercard on Saturday or on Friday or whatever, they go, we're going to have a battle royal with all these guys. Winner gets a future Intercontinental Championship match. Yeah, and but then- for, 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 for Gable, just as an example, it's like, what, is he gonna, he's going to face Brock? Hey, any of those guys. They're going to face but, Brock? Yeah, but, I mean, it changes the whole dynamic. Yeah. You know I mean? Like, the whole angle of all, the, all these guys, you know, Miz got, you know... Miz got cheated by him, but but like he beat Miz over and over again. You know what I mean? He beat Chad Gable over and over again, but they they left the hook for, you know, Chad. Chad was good. I mean, they were doing the program with Chad Gable and Gunther, and they just pulled the program and then threw Miz in, if you remember. Yeah. And then they just forgot about it. So now, you know, now they're going back to it. Shane and Zoe beat Candice and Indy. Quick match. Choked her out. Yeah. And that was the end of that. So, so. Um, they're they're obviously wrestling the Kabuki Warriors at some point. Not necessarily Mania, but at some point relatively soon. Truth is backstage. DIY and Miz showed up, and uh, they had an awkward segment. Apparently they're getting together to try to take out the Judgment Day. And and uh, R-Truth thinks that, that uh, Gargano and Ciampa are DX, and he thinks... And, and uh, Ciampa did that thing, that line, that Triple H line, too. So then we had a segment which... Maybe it was good on paper. Oh, oh, Regeneration X. Yes. Yes. So Drew comes out for a promo, and he's talking about facing Seth at Mania, and he makes fun of CM Punk for not being there. 
and said he. That was actually a pretty. That was actually a pretty good line using that that injury thing, and the doctor saying that you might have to miss mania, and he goes, "I'm not CM Punk." Yes, you know? I mean, he, I, I I think that the Drew the Drew McIntyre stuff has been exceptional. So he calls out Seth for a face to face, and the whole point of this segment is he says, you know, we uh, we have a chance to uh, have this match one-on-one, but you are going out there, and you're going to SmackDown, and you're dealing with The Rock and Roman Reigns and the Bloodline, and all that's going to happen if you do that is they're going to interfere in our match, and they're probably going to cost you the title and take away my clean win over you. And Seth has to get serious now. And he says, you might be right, but, hey, you might not be right. And, in fact, if somebody doesn't take care of these guys, they're going to uh, go after me, they're going to go after you, they're going to go after whoever wins. Somebody needs to take out Roman Reigns, The Rock, and The Bloodline. And so his story is that he's going to take the risk of going out there and trying to take them out. So that him and Drew can have a one-on-one match, at which point, may the best man win. So you'd get from this promo the impression that it's still a tag. And that is what you would get. That's the impression you get from this promo, yeah. Well, not even... I mean, yeah, I presume it's a tag, but... I mean, he's involved in the storyline, and Drew is, is upset that he's, he's uh, stirring the pot and potentially screwing up their match by having the bloodline involved in it. Yeah. Then we had Nia Jax and Lib Morgan, and uh, I will say I thought Nia was better in this match than she was in Australia. She actually sold more for Lib Morgan than she did for Rhea Ripley, and then at the end she slammed her in the post outside. Becky flies in out of nowhere, attacks Nia for the DQ, beats her up, sends her packing, and that sets up the Becky-Nia match for next week. We had an interview with Grayson about the main event. And Austin Theory is back there, and you can see he is clearly not happy. Yeah, because yeah. Because Grayson look, 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 threw him to the wolves on Saturday. Yeah, look, looked like uh, looked like there's a babyface turn coming. The um, the thing with um, you know, the line was when Grayson Waller said that uh, he had his back. When, if you remember, he did not when, have his back. Yeah, yeah, he just got out of the way when they were when they were all beating up on uh, Austin Theory. We had. Uh... Liv walking in, by the way, after Becky demanded a match with Nia, and she said, I was in the middle of something, but you don't care, do you? Not everything has to be about you, and she storms off. We got a graphic for Ole Anderson, and then we had a Jay Uso promo, and Jay was asked about, you know, what's next for you, and he goes, you know, I keep falling short time after time, and Drew walks up, and he says, I know you're having a rough time right now. I just want you to know you deserve it. <laughs> And so Jay jumps him. They have this huge pull apart. And Jay did mention in this segment the Intercontinental title. So presumably he would be in that match as well. Yeah. So, of course, we have uh, Grayson Waller and Cody. Hey, and real quick, um, Drew and Jay are wrestling uh, next week, too. Yeah. Grayson Waller and Cody. And it went like eight minutes. This is your main event. And Cody sold for a while and then hit the uh, cutter, hit the crossroads, pinned him. And we had 10 minutes left. And so out comes Paul Heyman. So so they, during this match, they kept pushing. That, Paul Heyman has arrived at the building. No, that it's, it's well, I'm sure he's always there. But they said that it, it, it's, it's broken on Twitter. So I wasn't paying attention to Twitter. Well, like, did they, like, send out a, a thing on Twitter saying Paul Heyman is in the building? Because they just. I mean, they just, must have, because they said at the beginning of this match, we've just been informed Paul Heyman has been spotted backstage at Raw. No, no, that it's on Twitter. That it's on Twitter. That's what they said. Well, yeah, on Twitter, it had been noted that he has been spotted backstage at Raw. Yeah. Like, those were their exact words. He's been spotted backstage. Well, one of the things on, you know, of course, now they have a relationship. In, in fact, I was, I was listening to the news yesterday um, on one of my drives, and um, it was um, Bloomberg, and they actually talked about, they had Elon Musk on, and they were talking about the deal with WWE. You know, wow. that, that, that they're... You know, you know, gonna the WWE's gonna be sending him clips and uh you know, which was the speed show. But um, you know, it was um so they're they you know, they are they are very much in bed together. So they will be promoting uh this thing and doing stuff with them, 
you know, not just they're not just providing them with five minute clips. They're going to be doing a lot more with them. So then Heyman does come out and he's got security guys, and he at first claims that they were New York cops. They sure look like local independent wrestlers to me. And then he says, well, they're suspended New York cops. So AJ basically, Kirsch. he's he's hired people to just AJ, beat Cody's AJ, ass. AJ Kirsch was a suspended New York cop? He was. It's his, uh, it's his by trade. Anyway, mm-hmm. Cody grabs a chair and says, if this is a bloodline setup, come get me. And so they had like nine minutes left. And so this was not Paul's best night. He's just kind of going on and he's just killing time and he begs Cody to withdraw the challenge from The Rock and Cody says I haven't trashed The Rock because we were once all fans of The Rock but I come from a family where every meal was determined by tickets sold nobody sold more tickets than The Rock but damn it I'm sick of being nice so come and get me and so Paul says well I got a better idea what if I get in this ring and Cody says don't get in this ring and so Paul sends his three cops in and Cody says, if any of you take one more step, I'm taking you all out. And Paul says, well, clearly you don't mean me, right? And he tries to get in the ring, and Cody says, I do mean you. And he beats up the cops. Another cop, by the way, took an unprotected chair shot because Cody threw a chair at his head, and he didn't bother putting his hand up or anything, which actually probably is on him because when someone does a throwing chair spot, it's your job to block, and this guy just stood there, and it went right in his face. And Cody beat them all up, and then Paul calls Roman on the phone, he calls Rock on the other phone, and Cody says, go ahead and call him. I don't care, because the bloodline isn't hunting me. I'm hunting the bloodline. And everyone chants Cody's name. And uh, the show's weird. I just want the show to be weird. Just a very talking, angle-heavy show. Well, that's what you're doing. It's WrestleMania time. You're, I know, but tra- usually in three hours, we got more than, like, two decent matches. That's, like, all we had. The rest of the matches were, like, a minute long. Well, it was it's just it's, it's 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 all about setting up mania. I mean, that's what the shows are. That's what they're that's what they're going to be. I mean, because they don't have, you know, like until the card is set, you're not going to, you know, you got to keep building these matches. And, um, you know, I'm, I mean, we didn't even really get any because I was like, going to say they spent three hours building up matches and we didn't even get any. We didn't get any super focused match. I know we got some intercontinental stuff that we can kind of guess at. And that was pretty much it. And then, like, in the Imperium New Day thing, which they had a really good match, when it was over, they basically said, this is the end of the feud. Yes, the feud's over, and we got nothing for either team right now. Yeah, so so Imperium... So I cannot say that all this talking was, like, a big benefit to WrestleMania. We were plugging matches well, we already no, no, knew. No, 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 no. It's, it's starting the ball rolling, you know, in, in things. Hopefully they follow up. But, but like, with Imperium, it looks like they're moving something with... They're, they're doing something with Imperium in Judgment Day. That's what it, you know? I mean, that's what it appears. And then New Day, I have or no they're idea. all just in that battle royal, mm. or whatever mm. they're going to do. I guess we'll find right. out soon enough. Yeah. All right, we got to wrap it up, everybody. We're totally out of time. Dave and I were up this weekend talking all of the shows and uh, new observers up. Hall of Fame issue. Dave did a Hall of Fame show with Garrett. We got back issues up. We got tons of shows. So check it out, everybody. We'll be back Wednesday with more. And that's it.